Um, hi, Deb. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> hey. Hi, Oli. <laughs> so I just want to say a word about what, why we're doing this series. And first of all, thank you. Thank you so much for making time. I really appreciate We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. uh, so for Skirball, um, we're uh, talking to scholars and artists, creative people, writers like yourself, who have shifted the paradigm of a, how a field thinks about something. So we've talked to a couple of people, Kate Stimson, who mm. founded the journal Science, that's really the first feminist journal in the 70s, Carol Gilligan, who listened to girls to think about how humanity conceives of morality, to Richard Schechner, to think about performance. And we're interested how a paradigm is actually shifted, how a way of thinking about the world has changed, um, and we're doing it at this time because we think a lot of people are realizing we're going into a country through major, major battles over how to view ourselves, how to view certain traditions and things. And I think especially younger people really want to understand how someone like you was able to work and really shift an entire field. So um, first of all, thanks for, for being here today. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a really great question as well. Um, how do we consider all of this in a time of 2020 with there's so many shifts going on in, in our lives? I think mine basically started out of love, you know, love of work, um, love of the field of photography, um, a curiosity about the missing links in the histories of photography. So my, my, interests and it started as a student so i really think it's really important to note that students um early on um when they began to study a field and find um, major gaps that their opportunity for them to to challenge and in a way that helps the field in a larger sense and it started with an undergraduate question of where are the black photographers in in the history books and I was studying at the Philadelphia College of Art then it was now it's the University of the Arts and the the professor I had then Ann Tucker said you know she had the same question when she was working on a book called the woman's eye um, okay. looking for women photographers so I, I think that um, that's important to note that if you have the support of, of, a, of a professor, because I've had other professors who did not support, um, that helps. And um, I was you know, looking for different stories um, outside of the images that we would see of Black people. At that time, it was always stoop labor. Um, it was always ragged clothes, dirty kitchens, mm -hmm. and they were circulating and I only saw those in books. Mm. So I, you know, would challenge that there are other images of black people. Why not show the broader evidence of black existence in, in, a, in that sense? And you, you've, I mean, I looked at obviously picturing us African-American identity and photography, which I think is about 25 years old now. Which yes, is, 25 years. Rereading it, it feels like you published it today. It has yeah. exactly the same relevance. And talk about the pictures that you knew, actually, that there were other pictures and other photographers and other traditions besides what was taught in school. Yeah, I, I grew up in Philadelphia, North Philadelphia. Um, I also grew up in a beauty shop. So my mom had um, magazines, photojournalist magazines. And I also grew up with a family that, that encouraged us to to well, it forced us to go to the library <laughs> to get pick up a book every every Saturday after chores. So, um, young person, first book that a picture book that I noticed was a book um, 
by Langston Hughes and Roy DiCarava, The Sweet Fly Paper of Life. <laughs> right. Which, which I have on my bookshelf. Yeah. And, I, and so say something about this book. So you found this book when you were a girl going Seven, to the library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the library and just sitting on the shelf, I pulled it out. It was, a, it was a book probably about six by eight or five by seven. It was a small book, manageable. I couldn't read the text, but I could see the photographs and the photographs were just amazing. Turning pages, seeing, seeing relationships with the older woman coming home from work or, or man and hats. So I saw black people that I recognized okay. and had the book for a while at home, but also as photojournalists, having Life Magazine and Ebony Magazine, I saw black photographers in the magazines. And so Gordon Parks was one of the first photographers that I knew in, in Life Magazine, but Ebony Magazine had like Manita Sleep who was um, active. And then our neighbor, Jack Franklin, who worked for the local uh, black press, which was called the Philadelphia Tribune. And he lived a block, about a block and a, way, a, block and a half away uh, from our home. He had cameras, you know, Graflex, he had uh, two and a quarter. So he had a Roly, he had all these cameras. And that's when I began as from like seven to like 12 or 13, photography was always central. Mm -hmm. And also in, in the family home, um, family albums were, were essential and fa family events. So documenting people playing bridge, um, playing sports, just eating. They were the images. But when, when we looked at American photography at the time in the 70s, it did not show that range. Right. And so I thought it was really important to look for Black photographers. And so, as I mentioned, the first books um, were the early books, but then the, uh, in 1968, I went to, I, the Met to see the Harlem um, on my Mayan exhibition. Right. And 69, it opened in 68, I went in 69. And so one of the first photo books I purchased was the Harlem on my Mayan catalog. I was, you know, I know that there were protests out there from artists who felt that social issues should not be in the museums and photography was not, um, uh, it was more uh, not seen as high art. So at that time, but as a, a budding photographer, I knew that this was a space that I wanted to be in. The enlarged photographs, sound, and all of those moments were significant for me as a photographer to look at Harlem. And Harlem was a place we visited as kids. And, and, I, and I loved the photography. And that's the first time I saw James Vanderzee's photographs. Right. So that was significant. And then, and then 70s rolled, and I'm in school, and then I, the Black Photographer's Annual was the other uh, second book that I purchased. And can you say something about Harlem on my mind, the show? So you referred to it several times in your writing. So mm -hmm. this showed an image of Harlem that also wasn't just social documentary. Mm -hmm. you, actually, you actually saw it in a, in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. I, I saw Harlem on my mind as a storytelling <laughs> event about Harlem. Huh. Um, Harlem, um, you know, there were signs from artists who said, Whitey has Harlem on their mind. Um, we have, you know, art on our minds in different ways. And so there were really, you know, contested moments but I felt that as an exhibition, it yes, it dealt with uh, social issues. It also dealt with um, impressionism in terms of art. It, it dealt with um, interior spaces mm -hmm. of joy mm -hmm. in um, the Harlem community. Um, there were individuals such as writers like Langston Hughes and County Cullen and big blow-ups of, of photographs of there, but then the photographer studio yeah. as, as a place of, as Alan Trottenberg says, um, a theater of desire, hmm. you know, to see how people walked into a photographer studio and what the photographer studios offered um, 
a place for um, people who were immigrants, migrants, who moved to Harlem. And, and, and I felt that seeing that exhibition to me, it had a lot of hope. Mm -hmm. um, hearing um, the voices of, of speakers like um, Marcus Garvey and singers um, from that time period were as you walk through the gallery. So there were, it was huge. You know, I think one of the the issues that the people had at the time were the the sea photography and blow as blow up images. Yeah. You know, like because it was what was it um, um, like super max screens at that time. So things were blown up. Okay. Now we're blowing them up again. Right. But, um, but so but so anyway, I see. I thought that was an, a a way of combating. Um, images in a, in a totally different way of, um, of Black people and, and, and then highlighting, you know, the works of Van Der Zee and another photographer, Lloyd Yearwood, and just other um, photographers who, Austin Hansen, who photographed Black churches in Harlem during that time. So it introduced me to a segment of photography that was unknown. Yeah, and, and 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 central to to my frame of reference to why I wanted to study photography. I want to ask you one specific thing because I've asked the other people. So you knew you were seeing something that was important, that was real, that was validated, but you also knew in school that wasn't shown, that wasn't studied. So. I'm always really interested, how did you trust yourself to think this is actually important enough for me to devote myself to? Um, you know, it, I think it's more, it was more of a, an experience of um, how do I rethink um, the field? How do I change um, my understanding of photography? I always was curious um, about images and and history fascinated me. Um, and so I think that it was just the, that initial reaction to, to seeing images that rarely, that we rarely, <clears throat> you know, seen at the time, you know, I can, I guess had a chance to observe at the time. So it, it's, I guess it sparked my imaginary, it, you know, it, you know, in terms of my imagination, it was just, themes were just flowing, you know, from fashion to references to growing up with uh, women in my family who loved Harlem, who loved singing, who loved fashion. So I could just place myself in this complex yeah. history. And I felt like I was walking with them in, in, this, in that sense. There's a sentence in your book, later you did a book on James Van Der Zee's amazing work and I really I really love this book because you kind of shifted even the understanding of him and you have this sentence you say these pictures are heroic and self-aware mm -hmm. I really like this combination that kind of the self-staging but there's this an awareness that comes from the the subject the sitting people who get, got into Van Der Zee's photo uh, studio and they knew he was going to transform them but they were participating in that mm -hmm. and that's true because I think that um, why it's important and why it's, I think storytelling is, is important is people, it's like saying I'm here and I'm, and my life matters. Mm -hmm. um, and having that visual evidence was, was important um, for people in, in Harlem for that exhibition or uh, when people move from North Carolina to Central Harlem, they sent photographs back to, as evidence of, even if they're borrowed clothes or clothes that they purchase, that they move forward. You know, it's like, I go to Abyssinian um, Baptist Church um, and seeing that photograph of the interior of, of Abyssinian Baptist Church with um, the funeral of, of Blanche Powell yeah. and how Van Der Zee in his Book of the Dead, he reimagined people's lives. You know, he photographed them during their lifetime and during death, he would just put a 
angel-like photograph somewhere in the image. But it, it also gave people who were unable to attend funerals because of long trips to see and be there. Yeah. And, and that was, that was a, to me, that was a, a life-changing event for, um, for people to have photographs of, of the dead. And Van Der Zee was a significant photographer to, uh, to be sensitive to that. What you just said, I had never thought of that, that actually this allows community to be much greater than the specific moment of that mm -hmm. funeral. Mm -hmm. that who couldn't mm -hmm. come and visit. They, they are sharing in an experience through those mm -hmm. photographs. Yeah, yeah. And talk a little bit, go back to when you were in college, so you're saying to your professor, I'd like to study black photographers mm -hmm. who don't yeah. exist on the reading list, who are not taught, who are not in the curriculum. And then you, how did you actually go about doing this? Yeah, I wrote a, um, a proposal for independent study project. And I uh, studied with Barbara Blondo, who was the chair of the department then. Unfortunately, she, she died a few years um, into the project. But um, I went, the Black Press is central. So of course, I went to the Black Press looking for names okay. and found 25 names. Okay. that I knew were um, still alive. And then another 50 names who were not. But then because of segregation and discrimination during the time that there, there were um, journals and, and city directories that were geared to a black um, community and one for a white community. So in, in, they often um, put an asterisk next to the, uh, the names of black or Negro or colored photographers at the time. So I knew that I wanted to first look at major cities in the South and in the North. I uh, sent letters to photographers that I could find of going to, I wrote to historical societies, I looked in the directories and it was amazing not having Google you <laughs> not having that opportunity to have access to, but it was fascinating because one of the first people, uh, photographers who wrote me back was Gordon Parks. And he said, I told him what I was doing. And he says, of course, Debbie, <laughs> I'll never forget his voice. <laughs> and when I called him and said, come and visit. And I, first time I visited UN Plaza, his apartment and having access to Gordon, which we stayed close throughout my lifetime, uh, his lifetime as well, rather. And, and I'm still in his life because I'm on the Gordon Parks Foundation board, but he opened the door and, and introduced me to his, his life. I met Morgan and Marvin Smith who were twin brother photographers who lived in Harlem and they they were photographers but they were also you know very handsome striking men who modeled for um, like for product models for different kinds of businesses like um, Chesterfield cigarettes or or alcohol or something like that but then they also after their photographic studio closed on 125th Street they moved to, into TV so they were like work for ABC and NBC. So they were in the industry, but I wrote to them and Monita Sleet who worked for um, Ebony Magazine. So I met a lot of um, people who, who were just happy to meet this, you know, like 20 something year old who was, who, were, who was interested in their, in their lives. And having that opportunity, I, I interviewed them. I wrote a paper. I um, went on to grad school. And when I started working at the Schomburg Center, I went to the Schomburg Center also to do research yeah. at the time, to conduct research at the time. But they only photograph, the photographs were all in one file folder by street scenes and ABCs and everything mixed together, not by photographers. And when I started working at the Schomburg Center, it was a fluke in terms of the job opportunity. Um, I was wa <laughs> walking down a hall at, at Pratt that I never ever walked out. And there was a big sign 
um, job opportunity at the Schomburg Center to, for a photo specialist. I mean, it was like my job, but I had already accepted a job at Bucks County Community College to teach photography there. And, you know, idyllic Bucks County. <laughs> so, and then I interviewed for um, the job, got the job, $8,000. It was 10 8 was the job for 10 8. And <laughs> it was amazing. And that was my opportunity to embrace and challenge this history. I entered into this field knowing how to research for photographs, but I had an opportunity to set the collection, to create a collection, to catalog the collection, and spend a lot of time looking at the Library of Congress um, information on how their card catalog. And the third month um, I was there, Richard Newman, I don't know if you know him, he unfortunately passed away, he was a fantastic mentor. He called me up and said, he asked if I wanted to do a book on black photographers. He said, how would you like to do a book of black photographers? I said, well, I have an undergraduate paper <laughs> with undergraduate language. <laughs> he said, well, send it to me. And I sent it to him and he says, you know, we have a book and let's do it as a biobibliography. So it's a resource. And, and then that was it. I found, I just, a lot of the photographs were at Chamber, you know, the photographs from people in South Carolina, like Arthur Macbeth, who photographed in Charleston and, and had a studio also in Baltimore. And so all over. And so creating that biobibliography, I found photographers in Haiti and different places like that. Wow, so you've, the book is really just, you thought, I'm giving this resource to the world. Mm -hmm. To go back to your first point, you must have loved what you were doing. You must have discovered so many things. That you oh, I loved it. Right. I, I, you know, I had Hank, my son was a kid, and I would have him, I would pick him up after school and take him back to Schomburg okay. <laughs> to work okay. with me, <laughs> to be in the archives with me. Because I, I mean, I, I was Debbie Schomburg. I love being a Schomburg. <laughs> You know, the people used to, the older photographers were, they were happy, you know, there were, there were photographers like Garland Anderson who worked for uh, the Apollo Theater and he had a, a lot of uh, photographs of the stage events and they were looking for someone to take their archives. Right. You know? And right. so that was really great. So the biobibliography is, is kind of the first book really you're doing. With yes, it was 1840 to 1940. So I, I used, um, had a short bio, probably about 500 to 1,000 words for the number of photographers, and then um, where to find them and what kinds of scenes that they had, um, that they covered in their, in their photography. It was a success. It was Garland Publishing. And he asked if I'd like to do another one, and, and we moved it from 1940 to 1988. Okay. And that was the... Um, second one and did you get a did you have a sense when it was success that people started responding so you felt less like you were yeah, well, <laughs> I, I had no idea i had never given a public lecture before and newark uh, museum was the first place who invited me um to to do a talk and um to talk about um photography I, I want to. I get it. I like this image of Debbie Schomburg. Like so, how was that? How did you feel suddenly you're on a stage or on a podium and thinking, "Wait, I'm presenting something people really care about." Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was, it was beautiful. Um, I was, you know, you know, you. It was, it was kind of spiritual in a sense. Um, growing up in the Baptist church, you have to stand up because your grandmother said, "Go up there, baby." and do what you're supposed to do, right? And, um, but you know, like you have to, that experience, you know, pushing you forward and each time I, you know, the first time I gave a lecture, um, I did not know that, um, that I was staged, I was, I was really frightened. Oh, really? And, and I, and I was told by, Andy Grunberg said this to me. He says, so if you don't have stage fright, then there's a problem, <laughs> okay. you know, because it means you know it all and you can't, 
receive. So, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, accept that. Okay. And that was really helpful, um, having that, that kind of critique of myself to think about uh, what it means to stand up for, quote, the race for my gender, <laughs> you know, to speak in Newark and to see people just happy to hear what I had to offer. And I talked about the um, Harmon Foundation um, photographs uh, during that time. Can you say something else about what you just said to that you were standing up, not just for yourself, but you, but someone said, you don't have to know everything. At the same time, people are probably looking and saying, there's, Deborah Will is coming in talking about something that is not part of the canon right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the opportunity for that talk, um, it helped me in terms of not only thinking as, as a Black woman, talking about Black photographers, but also it gave me an opportunity to place Black photographers in the canon, in the history. Mm -hmm. So as this first time speaker, I was imparting all the knowledge that I could find about these photographers. And then having that opportunity, it opened up a place for them, for these like James Latimer Allen, who, you know, soft focus, beautiful images, um, just looking at the beauty of Harlem. And beauty was never discussed when talking and speaking about black people um, in terms of looking at the images. So that was um, that was central in in that in that way. I have I want to say something. Um, there was a uh, uh, I was looking for a I, I some editors who didn't believe the histories about, <laughs> about what I felt about um, black photographers kind of wrote different things about one challenged me, felt that I was over exaggerating. Um, God, I don't have it, <laughs> I was looking for it, but they were thought that I was over exaggerating the, the histories of black photographers because I was placing them in and I saved all of the, the really racist negative feedback because it was felt that I was um, inflating. I, I just conducted an interview with um, Brendan and at, at, at Aperture and, and, and it's in that article. <laughs> so, so they were challenging you saying you're giving too much emphasis to these people's achievement or their role? Yes. Or to their achievement, to placing them in the history of, of photography. But the funny thing is that what's always striking to me, what they think the canon is, was constructed by somebody else like you who was in an archive and put them in a book. Exactly. And the idea that this was God given fell from the sky and now you're coming in and disrupting this pattern. <laughs> I just <laughs> disrupted it and said, how could I, what does he know? You know, this right. is impossible, you know? So but I, I'm interested that you just said you kept all those because I was just thinking you were aware there are people who are not agreeing with this or people are doing other histories or that was insulting the, the things that were said to me mm -hmm. um and I wish I had thought about having it available but um you know when just to think about photo secessionists um there were um King Daniel Ganaway was a photographer who lived in Chicago and photographed the Chicago River and you know he won the John Wanamaker Award in photography, and and because of one of his images that was in an exhibition, a photo secessionist, yeah. <laughs> and, and um, the uh, curators at the time down at the Portrait Gallery wrote um, just some awful things really? in terms of how how I how I read the inf the the. Um, how I read the images. And I'm just thinking, um, and I saved them and because, and I was, I wanted to do a response. Right. One person said to me, if you ever challenge a critic or challenge um, a curator, you'll never have a show in that place again. Wow. Um, you know, you'll never, so when you decide you're not gonna write or publish anymore, 
then you write your critique, and then you send that. Because if you want to, you know, really get work out there, you know, just save it. It'll 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 be more much more meaningful at a different time. So this is actually useful for young people today. So when mm -hmm. there are people like your students and our students who probably look at you and say they're also not met with approval everywhere and everybody mm -hmm. welcoming them. So you just said, I'm going to file this away and I'm mm -hmm. going to note it, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but take another moment to address it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and more, take that moment. Mm -hmm. it's, and, and, uh, and so after the New York lecture, you do the show, you do the second book. So this is from the 1940 to 1980? 88. 88, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, go, sorry. I, um, I, was invited by different people um, to write about photography um, in different collections. I was invited to, it was like the 150th anniversary of photography um, in 88, 89. And, and a number of people were looking for diverse voices to speak. And the uh, Williams College Museum invited me to curate a show anything I wanted to do. And I decided to do a show entitled Black Photographers Bear Witness. And, and I looked at social protests. <laughs> Who knew that when I look at the catalog now and think, wow, I was thinking about this way back then. And so I, I started curating um, shows then. I decided to go back to take a class in art history and get a degree in art history and museum studies at City. And um, that also helped me with my, my thesis for, um, it, I think I went back sometime in the mid eighties, but it was 86, I, I graduated. And I, my thesis was entitled Black Theater and Photographs. And from the um, 18, 15, 1890s to, to then, it was the 1980 something. And it really gave me an opportunity to look at Williams and Walker and all of the vaudeville pieces and then Black Broadway in terms of uh, off Broadway and all of the big uh, presentations, but also looking at photographers who, who photograph uh, Black theater, um, theatrical productions, but also photographing Black people who traveled the world um, as artists. And it also gave me an opportunity to think about women who, who had, did not desire to do domestic work, but had work as cultural workers, as artists, and, and to see them in, on the stage. So we, I began to see how women had hope mm. um, in the uh, 19 teens to see their lives in theater, on stage, um, you know, um, shuffle along, you know, that kind of right. Ubi Blake and traveling. And, and that was another, so that, that thesis ended up uh, being an exhibition. And so I um, created, curated an exhibition at the, um, at the Chamber. We had a small corridor gallery and a lot of people were probably in their 80s and 90s then. Like I met Honey Coles, you know, from Coles and Atkins, and I met Charlie Atkins. And they would come in and had invited, I started doing public programming. So I opened up a, a new line of um, in inquiry for, for um, artists who were elderly and old and dancers um, at the time. Ellis Hazlip was working at Schomburg and, and he mentored me. He, he was, he had the TV show Soul um, and, and there's a documentary traveling now with this documentary on, on his life. So it really enhanced my interest in um, working at Schomburg to create, I didn't even know there was life after Schomburg, you know, because I love being <laughs> at work. And, uh, but there are people that who resented my love of my work. And that's something that people need to recognize that not everyone's going to feel the same kind of energy about your work. And I remember um, the director at the time said to me, um, 
I think you need to do a moratorium on your outside activities. I said, but my outside activity is my personal life, my weekends, my da 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 da. And he's so he says, well, you know, some of your colleagues feel that you're just doing too many things. And um, and I said, but how? What? Who? And 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 then I realized it was one person. <laughs> you know. And what was the resentment? What was driven? Because didn't because that's what looking back we think. You did these things, you curated, you wrote books, you helped, especially older folks. I have no idea. Recognized, but I have no idea. I, I, it puzzled me. Yeah. It puzzled me because I I loved it so much and I had no idea that that there was these people, there were people who did not. And one of, uh, I did not feel the same way. One of the photographers that I photographed and and spent a lot of time with uh, Bert Andrews. He he had he has a book called In the Shadow of the Great White Way, and he photographed black theater black theater on Broadway. And he said to me, he says, "You definitely are an Aquarian." He said, "You are just like Langston Hughes." He said, "Langston Hughes used to travel around for a hundred dollars, fifty dollars, giving a talk, not even oblivious to people who who are angry that he's doing all this work." <laughs> traveling around because you're just loving the work that you're doing. I know, but, but that, that's why, because I'm an Aquarius, as you know. Like, I totally get that. And then I'm surprised when people think, why are you doing all this? I'm like, I'm not doing anything. Like, I don't even feel I'm doing anything. I'm like, why are you paying attention? So exactly. you must have been struck by someone saying you should not be doing things to talk about it. And yeah. It must have been really an odd experience. It, it was. It was. But when he, he when he, um, connected me with Langston Hughes, who was my idol. Yeah, right. I, was like, I was in the right, right train, <laughs> right train to thinking, man, that was great. But it's nice that you connected to people when you just said women in the 19 teens and 20s who thought there's another life possible. Mm -hmm. In the photographs you found in this documentation of black theater, et cetera, there's another life possible that has already been lived. Mm -hmm. It's not a future thing. Some hope is doing. This is already there. Yes, and you know, and then I met um, <laughs> names are going for a second, but it'll come in a second. Um, she, uh, Alberta Hunter, and you know, I met Jean Claude uh, Baker, unfortunately, who passed away. But uh, through Jean Claude, I met Alberta Hunter, and then she talked about you know, the Nazi camps and how, you know, black um, artists were placed in uh, concentration camps when during their time there and the difficulties they had mm -hmm. um, and staying in that, that lifestyle, but bringing them back, coming back in their seventies and eighties and performing in America, what it meant for them. And so at the time Schomburg had a chance to get uh, Ada Bricktop uh, Smith's collection. So there were a lot of collections that were coming in to the Schomburg at the time. And, and so I, I lived their lives through their photographs. <laughs> Amazing, right? Mm -hmm. and, and did your life get sort of, because you started to do much more public work, the books were coming out. So how did you ultimately grow out of the Schomburg? The, um, it, you know, outside of <laughs> being told <laughs> that okay. it's your time, <laughs> my, um, my friend uh, Claudine Brown had had invited me to be a part of the National African American Museum Advisory Group, and that was in eighty. It was in eighty nine and ninety, and that um, Mary Smith Campbell was also on that advisory committee as well. And the Smithsonian was beginning of looking at how to create the museum and is it feasible. Um, my son was 13 at the time and he wanted to uh, go to boarding school. And I'm like, you can't leave me. <laughs> and so he wanted to go to Episcopal a boarding school down in Virginia. And that same year, um, the, when the advisory committee recommended that they should create, that the Smithsonian should create a exploratory uh, staff mm -hmm. um, to see if there are collections because people did not believe that there were viable collections to create a museum. 
And uh, funny story, that that's another funny story that's <laughs> highly personal and, and highly, really difficult that um, there was also a position at the National Portrait Gallery for photography curator. <laughs> and, and so I, of course I applied for it. Um, so I could move to DC and, and, but then there was also the position at the, um, the project, the Smithsonian project. And I had just curated the Vanderzee show at the same time. So it was all happening at the same time. And to leave New York was really difficult. I loved being in New York. I loved the Upper West Side. So it was all that energy to move to DC. And um, I was hired to, to become a curator and travel around the country looking for collections to create a report for Congress, to create a report for the Smithsonian to say that these are people who are contacting us these are the collections that we need to go after. These are uh, sensitive collections based on age-wise, um, uh, age of the donors. Um, so that happened through that experience. And so I was hired at the, um, at the Smithsonian through Claudine Brown. Um, and I interviewed four times for the portrait gallery position <laughs> and, and they're basically trying to tell me, you know, this is not where we, we should want to have this position. <laughs> but, but I said, no, I really want this job because I, you know, I was, photography was my, was my area and I loved it. But I'm so happy that I was there on the ground floor of the museum. And that's, so I moved there in 92 and just started, um, looking for collections. I travel the country. I travel homes and looking at um, people's uh, archives and, and artwork and clothing. And we created a, a, a fantastic report. We created newsletters. Um, we had a dialogue. Um, we had difficulties because um, there were people in Congress who did not want us to exist. So we had to continue to fight for the uh, existence. And then also other museums were concerned that if it goes to the Smithsonian, that other museums will feel that they're gonna lose out on some of these collections. So rightfully so, people were concerned. And um, so I stayed there for uh, like almost 10 years. And um, one day I, I cur started curating shows there. And the first show I curated there was called Imagining, Imagining Families, Images, Images and Voices. And the, the show um, in, included 15 photographers, Black and white, um, Latina and, and Asian, to imagine family. And I wanted people to enter into the Arts and Industries building to think about family. How can we see Black people as human, one, and our stories are all the same, you know, even though that we've had difficult moments in, you know, all of our lives at different times. And so I wanted to enter into it through an art form. And so that's where I, I, I started curating exhibitions there. I remember the education department said, well, no, that, that doesn't really sound right. And then when then they did a survey and I still have it somewhere. And she said, they got it. They really got it. I'll never forget her voice. I said, <laughs> they couldn't understand that we could have an integrated show at the Smithsonian as an African-American initiative to think about how do we talk about culture um, through the arts. So what did they get, do you think? What, does, what, <laughs> what, what, what switch turned or whatever it's called? Flip. <laughs> but just to hear her say, they got it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I still hear um, what they got was what I tried to tell her that we are human and we all have stories to tell and we could tell it through the arts. And we could tell it through the difficult stories of um, the moment of a, a guard who there was a white woman who made quilts out of for families whose, son, whose sons and fathers 
and brothers were lynched um, and put it in the show um, because many of them were wrapped, bodies were wrapped in, in quilts and, and photographs. And so anyways, one of the guards challenged me and said, I'm not gonna protect this. You know, I'm not gonna protect this. You know, you can't have this in the show. Huh. Um, and, and her name was Faye Fairbrother and she was, her work was fantastic. And we, you know, we had um, uh, another um, photographer artist who created a piece called um, The American as, a Bel as the Melting Pot. And she created it boiled in the melting pot as Asian Americans you know, in San Francisco, what it felt like in terms of being othered. Um, so the range of stories were, were pretty amazing. And, um, and it also sensitized me as a curator to think about audiences in different, in different ways, it's specifically a DC audience that's m mainly a, um, a uh, tourist. Um, Right. They're not looking for politics, they're looking for warm and fuzzy, and it really opened up. And people wrote in, and I still, I've saved the, the comment books that people wrote notes saying things like, I didn't know we looked like this, thank you for sharing these experiences, things that really just made her say they got it. <laughs> right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. But I like that you, you can still hear that, mm -hmm. got it, it's mm -hmm. nice. Mm -hmm. The guard's comments, where do you file that away in your head? Well, it, he was so angry with me. And I, I had to backtrack because I recall when I had an exhibition at the Schomburg on about conflict. And I can't remember the title. It'll come in a second. And someone had given us um, from the Stetson Kennedy collection a um, clan um, uniform robe a whole bit with and we had the images we had the collection with papers and letters and things just describing it and a mannequin with the clan and there was a, a window at the Schomburg that faced uh, Lenox Avenue and at night, it was only one light in the reading room that people could see this narrow light. And one day a woman walked in and said, I need to talk to you about this, this image here. I work at night, I leave the hospital and I see this image. I grew up in the South. This is haunting. It's, it's a terrorizing experience to leave. And I see because her family's killed by the Klan. And I had no idea that you could see the image in, through the window. It was like placed in the, around in the gallery in the reading room. But when I walked out and could see it through her lens hmm. and the terror it caused her, hmm. it just really opened my hmm. mind to how to create an experience that not only um, terrorize terrorize someone but also how to for me to sensitize myself to um, the viewer experience and so I just we didn't take the down we just shifted it from the window and put it against the wall and and then using language like this may cause blah blah uh, difficult experience memories and um, and so it I had to I had forgotten about it when I moved to the Smithsonian and I was so angry with the guard and and then um, he watched people walk through the exhibition through all of the different experiences through the exhibitions and saw how they responded to it and talked about it. And then, because he would try to say things like, oh, you, what do you think about this? I don't want this in here. What do you think? And then they would talk about why it was important for them to see it. And because they remembered um, their own experiences with the uh, quilts and things like that. So, you know, just in terms of a, terms of a two-way street for me, in terms of having a talk back right. moment. Right. right, wow. 
Yeah. I mean, it's really, I'm just sort of staying with these experiences, actually the two sides of a woman mm -hmm. in Harlem saying this is triggering and re I'm recalling and then the guard saying, I won't even bother to protect this. I don't mm -hmm. want the story to be told. Where do you think in the country right now where we're sort of debating really what stories deserve to be told and remembered, when you look back at these, this time, which to me sounds like five minutes, but it's- Yesterday, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> sort of all of it is- yeah. um, mm -hmm. Where's your energy right now in terms of what you're doing right now to, because we are, it seems to be in, in similar debates again mm -hmm. or still or. Yeah, they, we are. And, and I recognize that. And when, um, with the unfortunate deaths of, um, you know, eight black people this, this year and 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 also with over two hundred thousand people with COVID, just and you know, of course, we we lost friends and family members. I'm always thinking about how do we think about humanity at this time? How can we sensitize people to experiences that that are at hand that we need to make a change? We need to make change. Um, I wanted to make photographs, but I didn't leave the house during um, the lockdown. But I made photographs of joy, people coming out to clap and bang. And, you know, so I made photographs of those moments. And then um, unfortunately, after when George Floyd um, was killed and, and Breonna Taylor, um, to see um, the young people who, again, we had the same kind of marches in the 60s to, to now, um, to see their experiences, I thought it was just important to kind of reflect and write about how I felt about seeing it and how do we um, tell their stories and encourage um, the work. And I just think that if it's a way that we could show, um, the, uh, Pamela Newkirk and I are teaching a class called Black Lives Matter and we have students who never had black teachers before. And they wrote and they say, thank you for teaching us this. Thank you for sharing. I've never had papers, and we talk about it often, that students first thing they say is thank you. You know, yeah. this was a great opportunity for me. Um, and, and because then they had a chance to reflect on what they were experiencing at the time, but also to think about what they missed in their educational process. And so all of that's happening at the same time with me as a teacher and then with my photography, uh, just the same. I writing and making images about the experiences of, of the now. Yeah. Do you think this generation is more aware? Like in some ways, it's hard for you probably to assess your own impact in a way, but I think what you've really shifted that there's much more awareness of the the, the deep range of <clears throat> humanity and of African American life in America that it's no longer a kind of one track depiction mm -hmm. of like let's say the social documentary lens has been shifted mm -hmm. and that yeah. has really been your interest from the beginning right to sort of say let's like like look at the complex the fullness of life mm -hmm. and I think that um, having an opportunity to teach and to give lectures, I, I receive notes of thanks um, for people to saying that this is opening up their eyes um, to new ways of seeing and new ways of reading um, experiences that they couldn't ever talk to anyone about. And, and this is not only white or Asian or Latinx, it's, it's black as well. And so we are, we're at a, we're definitely at an intersection of people passing each other and, and asking questions, looking back and looking forward at the same time. Right. right. Is there one photographer and all the people you've curated, talked about, written about that is really a standout for you that someone you'd like to go back to, someone you really love? I mean, maybe it's not fair. Maybe you don't want to identify one among the many people. You know, I think Carrie Mae Weems. Yeah. She is someone that I could go back to. Someone asked me if you were going on a desert island, what book would you take? 
Okay. Um, the photo book would you take? Um, and I said, you know, I'd take Carrie Mae Weems' book mm -hmm. because of her interest in not only performing history, but interrogating history and making images. So I would, I would say Carrie as, as a contemporary and the historical aspect of it is still Van Der Zee. I could still look at his images. Right. <laughs> and, um, and, and then the, in terms of walking through the shoes, I had, um, I was at the American Academy in Rome last year in 2019. And I, my project was to walk in Gordon Park's footsteps in Rome in 1949. Okay. And I wanted to find every place that he photographed. And I wanted to experience Gordon in Rome. And, and I did. And it, it was difficult because he didn't have street scenes, street signs. <laughs> or so I kind of walked through and found and I met photographers and it would show them a photograph that Gordon did in 1949. And they said, oh, that's at such and such. And oh, wow. nice. Via Maguta and you go here. And so I, I did that. And so that was, that's someone between Gordon and Carrie, I think they're the two that I would take with me. <laughs> Just to, just to read about. Mm -hmm. Deb, I want to say um, thank you. And what I really take from your work is that the love and joy you have doing your work, which mm -hmm. in some way also, and I know you as a colleague and sort of um, at NYU, the, the energy you bring to it, it's just um, really inspiring. So it's really great. It's really okay. nice to see that you can take that from the work um, and uh, so on behalf of Jay also and NYU Skirball, we just want to thank you for being part of this today. Okay, great. Thank and, you. Yeah, so and and, and especially because since, since you didn't listen to the Schoenberg person who said you have to stay in your lane. Right. <laughs> We're glad you took an hour out of your schedule because I know how busy you are. <laughs> okay, take care. All right, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.